freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it on to our children in the bloodstream. The only way they can inherit the freedom we have known is if we fight for it, protect it, defend it, and then hand it to them with the well-taught lessons of how they in their lifetime must do the same. And if you and I don't do this, then you and I may well spend our sunset years telling our children and our children's children what it once was like in America when men were free. Hey everybody, welcome to episode number 431 of Gun Freedom Radio, where we engage, we educate, and we inform. We are brought to you by azfirearmsauctions.com, where you set the price on guns, ammo, and accessories. I am one of your hosts, Cheryl Todd. And I'm the other guy, Dan Todd. Our theme today is what every American should know, and our guest is John Payne. John is the author of the Second Amendment Manifesto, what every gun, what every American should know with their constitutional rights to own guns. John is a lifelong lover of history, firearms, and freedom. John is not an ac ac academic or pol politician, but an American who believes that our country and culture is worth fighting for, and that the start that starts by understanding our rights as protected under the Constitution. Welcome to the show, John. Hey, thank you for having me, both of you. Absolutely. I am so excited to have you on, and we've been trying to organize our calendars forever. And so we find ourselves sitting in the, the studio on All Hallows' Eve. So I don't know if there's any <laughs> if there's any connection there that we happen to be in the, the studio on October 31st, 2023, uh, to just start unpacking this whole idea about um, what every American needs to know about our second amendment, but thank you so much for finding the time. Of course. Thank you for having me. So hold up your book so people can see what they're looking for. Sure. Second amendment manifesto. Now I've been listening on audiobook, but I don't think my phone shows up and I actually, uh, truth be told, have an hour and 16 minutes left, but, um, I have just been, I have learned so much listening to this book that I I went and did a, a presentation at a, an event called AmCon where I was in front of a bunch of other media, uh, Second Amendment media people. And um, I was telling them about it, that if we don't know our history, that's that's the the baseline that the other side is constantly digging away at, right? If we don't understand our, our foundation and you've given us such a great foundation, um, the book actually is filled with world history dating back from ancient Greece and runs a thread all the way to this particular time in history, modern day America. And I just, I want to unpack it a little bit, but my first question is you're a young guy <laughs> Are and you say you're not you know, an academic, maybe you're not a historian, but I think you are. What was the driving force that that caused you to write this? Well, first of all, thank you for sharing information about the book with others. Yeah, that's really why I wrote it. Um, and to answer your question, this largely came about because I have a, a good number of friends who are actually Europeans, and I would often get in conversations with them. Europeans generally don't value gun rights uh, as much as Americans do. So those were always fun conversations where I would be uh, making the typical arguments, right? So things like, you know, when uh, seconds count, the cops are minutes away, stuff like that, you know, largely focusing on just personal self-defense. And I do think that's very important. But the more I, I talked about it, the more I realized how little I knew about it. So, you know, I could repeat all of the normal kind of NRA talking points. And again, I agree with almost all of those even to this day. But I think there, I, I got the sense there was a lot I was missing in those conversations. And I don't like to argue for ideas that uh, argue strongly for ideas that I don't fully understand. So I, I could feel I was on thin ice in those conversations. And it got me thinking about, you know, what am I missing here? Where did this come from? Why does the US have this? And you start looking at the numbers, and it really is just wild. Like this is a, a the the history of weapons ownership is very long and very deep, as you know, after reading the book, but 
the United States is in such a unique position now where, I mean, civilian ownership of guns, so small arms, we're not talking about rocket launchers, stuff like that, but small arms is more uh, just private ownership in the United States is more than the next seven largest militaries in the world combined. So uh, there's really never <laughs> been a situation like this before. And it's not even close, by the way, <laughs> it's much more. And it's that data is actually based on, you know, I wrote this book around 2020. So uh, there was obviously an explosion of gun ownership um, and new gun purchases since then. So it's probably much higher now. Uh, you know, I would estimate uh, you know, the official numbers are it's somewhere north of 400 million. It's probably, you know, half a billion at this point. Um, you know, and that's not, you know, there are many, many guns that are not registered or uh, where gun sales haven't been recorded, right? Like older rifles and you know, collector's items, things that could still be used, uh, you know, effectively. So, um, yeah, that's really where the, the genesis of this book came about is just my own ignorance uh, on a topic. And, you know, I, I think I was maybe more informed than uh, your average person, but it still wasn't up to my standard for, you know, making a, an effective argument. Um, and I do think, you know, again, the, that's like the, the logical explanation of why I wrote the book, but maybe the more emotional reason is I, I do care about this very much. Uh, and I think one of the most uh, effective ways to preserve this right is to just argue for it effectively to the people around you. You know, I think in the United States today, and this goes for almost any issue, regardless of where you fall in the political spectrum, we have a sense that really nothing we say or do matters at this point. Uh, you know, it doesn't really feel like our votes count or you know affect anything. It doesn't feel like the people in office are really doing any of the things we uh, supposedly put them there to do. So then the question is, well, how can you influence uh, current events and how can you influence the direction of our country? And I think a very effective way is to focus on your local community, focus on your friend circle. If you can reach maybe a bit farther outside of that. Uh, by say writing a book or having a podcast like you all are doing, I think that's great as well. But a lot of it, what you don't want is a lot of people who have kind of a vague notion that maybe something's not right, or you know maybe we should you know protect our right to to bear arms. But then when it comes to the crunch, there's really just no argument there. And I think you do have to be armed with you know, good arguments when when you get into a conversation with somebody who is open minded, who genuinely wants to know the answer of you know why should we care about this. Maybe they are kind of a fence sitter, bringing them over and explaining to them like, hey, this, this is why it matters. Um, and, you know, uh, some people will never be convinced, right? You have people who uh, will always be against this idea uh, for various reasons, uh, the idea that Americans have the right to bear arms or anybody has the right to bear arms. Uh, but there's a lot of people in the middle who I think can be swayed. So that's why I wrote the book. Well, it's tremendous. And I have to say, I am uh, so much of what you're saying is echoing with why we even have a show called Gun Freedom Radio. Uh, we had a small gun shop and it was about two years old when uh, President Obama was elected to his first term. And right away, there just was this onslaught of negative um, messaging about who we are as human beings, basically, you know, yeah. not only you know, gun owners, but people who carry guns and God forbid those who sell them. Oh, we were like the purveyors of death rather than merchants of death. Yeah, exactly. Rather than people serving their community to, to help people have tools of self-defense, tools of hunting, tools of, you know, uh, recreation and enjoyment. It was so bad that we were even afraid when we first got into this, we were afraid to say we were gun owners. Yeah. Because, yeah, sure. you know, we'd, they'd say, what do you do for a living? Well, we have an auction house mm -hmm. and a gun shop. Yeah. And that, <laughs> and and we have soon learned that was wrong, that we need to be proud that we're gun owners and responsible gun owners. It's true. But so just like you're saying, I wanted to be better educated. It's like I knew how I felt, but trying to articulate it, I felt flat and short. And so we thought, well, let's put microphones in front of conversations with subject matter experts. So as I'm learning, right, I'm, I'm giving other people these, the same opportunity. And I am telling you, it's been the most exciting and rewarding experience. We've met some of the best people on the planet like yourself and um, have learned so much, but isn't that interesting that we have such a similar reason for, you know, and you know, what's really interesting to me is we, there's a lot of people on the fence mm -hmm. that they don't know which way to go. And we have been able to help uh, guide them, not 
force them to our side, but, you know, guide them to let them know what is the, re the reason to carry a gun or own a gun versus uh, not having a gun. Well, it's sure. true. And, you know, too often Americans think that we invented the idea of gun rights, right? Or, you know, we invented the idea of freedoms in general. And after going through your book and seeing so much history that some of it was brand new to me, um, which is exciting for me and a little bit jarring, like, why don't I know these things? Um, but uh, some of it was also sort of like, oh yeah, you're filling in blanks for me. Like I had some vague ideas of things, um, but England experienced a war over gun rights. I was like, what, how is this possible? Because as we sit today, they have, pretty much relinquished all of those rights. And yet at some point people picked up arms to protect their right to have arms. Talk to us about that time in history. Sure. Yeah. I think that's a very important point that they, and, and this is something where I think a lot of gun rights organizations, such as the NRA, uh, to use a, an overused pun, shoot themselves in the foot a little bit where <laughs> there's so much emphasis, haha. Ha, yeah. There's so much emphasis on the self-protection element and that this is, you know, and I'm a believer in American exceptionalism in many ways. I do think it's a, an amazing country and a very unique country. Um, but the idea that you have the right to defend yourself uh, and then by extension, you have the right to have access to the tools you need to effectively do that. That is not a, an American invention. We did a good job of uh, codifying that right and protecting it and better, I think, than most other countries, such as England. Uh, and, you know, the English Civil War, which is what you're referring to. So just to clarify, it wasn't just about gun rights. You know, that was a, a war that, uh, like most wars, right, there was a religious element. So Protestants and Catholics, uh, you had, uh, you know, going after each other. And then also you had just your typical power struggles uh, at the time, right? So England for many years, really, um, you know, except during the uh, the Roman occupation and then after William, um, you know, it's been a very violent uh, uh, island for a long time. Um, and that's true of Europe as well. So uh, it was largely about religion, largely about just power politics. Um, what made that war really unique, though, was it was one of the first wars in England where guns played a really important role. So you had the Thirty Years' War, which started in, I want to say, 1618, went to about 1648, but that was mostly in continental Europe. And guns, they did play a role there. Now, you can actually go to museums in you know, Europe, and you'll see, you know, it's very interesting where you have this crossover of um, ancient weaponry, right, like uh, just metal plate armor, but then you're also starting to get arc buses and these other uh, guns coming out. So you have, you know, breastplates with bullet holes in them. Uh, it's very interesting. So... Uh, yeah, in, in um, the middle uh, and early 1600s, you have this war that kicks off uh, in England, and guns play a huge role. Uh, so by this point, guns are actually fairly common. Uh, it's not like everybody has one or you know where every soldier is issued one. Uh, swords and other you know, weapons do play a role. Uh, and you can see some of this. There's actually a, a movie called Cromwell. It's been a long time since I've seen it, but you get a sense from that movie. I don't know how historically accurate it is overall, but one of the things it does right is it shows guns playing a very important role in that war. Um, and that's really why that became such a, a contentious point is because you had wars before, but they were mostly fought with edge weapons, uh, projectile weapons, catapults, swords, arrows, things like that. But in this case, guns were extremely important. And as a result, you also saw both sides trying to restrict access of their enemies' uh, ability uh, to, to get guns. So of course, right, if they're in this very effective uh, modern military technology, uh, you want your people to have it and you want the enemy to not have it. Um, and because you had this religious element, uh, it was a little bit schizophrenic, kind of like modern American politics, where you know a Catholic would come into power, they would start restricting the rights of Protestants to have guns. You'd have a Protestant leader who comes into power, they start restricting the rights of Catholics to have guns. So you had this, uh, you know, fight between them over gun rights, and that's what that led to. Eventually, was uh, you know, so long story short, to summarize, it's a very bloody war. Uh, eventually, the Protestants get the upper hand. Cromwell comes into power. Uh, he. Yeah, there's a lot of debate about Cromwell, but um, eventually he gets pushed out as well, or he dies, uh, to be fair, but his government was unpopular, put it that way. So the system that arose thanks to Cromwell eventually gets replaced again with a monarch. And you had a very strange uh, moment in history where you have a, a populace that 
has uh, essentially an authoritarian leader in Cromwell that was supposed to be some kind of pseudo democracy, uh, but really it just gets replaced with authoritarianism, kind of like the French Revolution about 100 years later with Napoleon. Um, or you could say modern Russia, right, where you have a, a brief period of democracy, it doesn't go well, they end up with a, a more centralized leader. Um, and then they end up inviting this guy uh, from mainland Europe, uh, William of Orange, and he takes over England. But what's really interesting about that point in history, not only did they invite uh, an authoritarian leader to come lead their country because they did not like how things were going uh, without the monarchy, they also had stipulations. And this is where things get interesting, where you start, it's not, you know, there's really no such thing as absolute power. All monarchs have been contained in some way or another, whether it's through an aristocracy or uh, just various um, you know, handshake agreements throughout history. Like you, you don't really have a full authoritarianism, uh, I think, in almost any period of history. But in this case, they invited this guy to come in as king. But they said, if we're going to give you all this power, we do want certain guarantees. We there are certain conditions that come with that, and one of those was uh, the right to bear arms. Now. That early version of the right to bear arms, it was pretty vague. Um, you know, you can go read the wording uh, yourself. I don't remember it off the top of my head, but it allowed many different, uh, you could say, vectors of attack. Like there, if you're a lawyer, there are a lot of things you could nitpick about the wording to say, well, this doesn't really apply here. And technically, it's only guaranteeing it to Protestants for this reason and yada, yada, yada. Um, and but had it was to have a start. so much land under your, you know, under yep. your title or whatever. So, yeah, it was to go, but yeah. go on. Yeah, yeah. So there were, it was um, not as specific or as um, you know broad as it probably should have been, but it was a good start. And it set the precedent for, hey, this is something we should take seriously and really write down. And this is another important point that I think is worth bringing up. You know, there's uh, in America, especially, we tend to be very legalistic. So if something is written down, um, we say, hey, we, we point to the Constitution. We say, this is the rule. You're not following it. You know, we're going to go to the Supreme, Supreme Court and argue this. Whereas that's actually a, a very, um, it, it's a very strange phenomenon. If you look at history, a lot of customs, a lot of practices, a lot of the things we would call rights nowadays were really just very strong traditions. So, like in England, for example, you had a very strong tradition of weapons ownership, and that dates back. You know, really all. You know, early societies had weapons ownership of some sort, right? If you go into a Mongol camp or a Roman city or anything like that, a lot of people had weapons. Uh, and part of that is because weapons at for most of history were almost indistinguishable from normal tools, right? So a bow and arrow you can use for hunting, you can use it for defending yourself, a knife you use for cooking, it could also be you know a weapon. So mm -hmm. it wasn't like nowadays where you don't, and it's true that you don't need guns for most people don't need guns for your day-to-day -day activities, right? The same way, you know, I use a knife almost every day when I'm cooking, right? Um, mm -hmm. I don't use a gun every day when I'm cooking. So uh, there's more separation, I think, between the civilian use of guns and you could say the uh, the military or violent use of guns. Um, but uh, I, I think I'm straying from your question a little bit. But yeah, the basic idea there um, is that weapons ownership has existed for a very long time. England was really the first place where that started to uh, sh morph away from being just a really strong tradition where, mm -hmm. uh, say, in like Roman times, it would be unthinkable for your average person or Greek times even, right, to not have like a spear or a sword or something like that. Now, of course, not mm -hmm. every single person, right? And there were class distinctions. Maybe, you know, if you're in Sparta, the helots, you know, the slave class would not have weapons, of course. But your full citizens, your normal citizens, your middle class uh, of any of these societies generally had pretty unrestricted access to weapons. And one of the things I talk about in the book as well, that modern historians, they try to undermine this idea by saying, well, you know, in the Roman times, it was only soldiers who had swords and, you know, these other things. And first of all, not true. Many people own the uh, weapons. And then two, those were private weapons. So it wasn't like the government owned your sword and, you know, loaned it to you uh, to do your military service and then took it back, which is, of course, how it works nowadays with militaries in most parts of the world. But the Romans owned their own weapons, the soldiers, and there's a lot of evidence for this. Uh, and even as recently as, say, 100 years ago, um, there's a really interesting book by, uh, he's the most decorated soldier of World War One. His name's Ernst Jünger, and he was a German soldier, so he was fighting for Imperial Germany. And he writes just very offhandedly about after he came home, he brought back some guns with him from the front. And it was no big deal. Uh, this was very common practice. You know, U.S. soldiers did this in World War II as well, right? So we have a lot of, you know, K-98s and German weapons that were brought back. And 
uh, you can just see that was even at that time, uh, just 100 years ago, you know, 1918, that was still very common. This idea that, uh, you know, just civilian ownership of weapons, uh, even after you came out of the military, was completely acceptable. So what is unique about the United States, though, is that we took that idea of putting that in writing um, and using that as a way to protect these rights so that we didn't just have to depend on tradition. Um, because the problem with that is that if enough people don't believe in that tradition anymore, or they don't have the will to defend it against an overbearing government, then it does disappear. So having that written down is something you can point to and use to defend. You know, the minority of people can use to defend themselves against the whims of the majority. Yeah, absolutely. And there was uh, certain times in history, even you know, in Europe, where there was um, a requirement to mm -hmm. have arms in in your home. And why was that? To protect against predators. Uh, you know, um, you know, foreign uh, armies or foreign people trying to come in and and uh, take over. And one of the names that came up in your book that made me have to kind of pause for a minute was Machiavelli, because we always think of, you know, Machiavellian, you know, anything that you, know, you describe something as Machiavellian, it's, you know, very sinister and very horrible. And yet he shared some of my, my thoughts and opinions about firearms ownership. Right. So that was very interesting. Can you uh, clarify that for our audience? Sure. That was a surprise to me as well. So, you know, most people know Machiavelli from his book, The Prince, which is basically uh, how to be an autocrat effectively. <laughs> it's a, mm -hmm. a manual for an authoritarian <laughs> leader. And uh, it's, uh, yeah, it's really exactly what it is. Um, and a lot of the things he espouses are pretty, pretty brutal, right? Like killing yes. political opponents, uh, things that as Americans, especially we find very abhorrent, right? So shutting down, uh, you know, the press, like freedom of the press, Machiavelli would laugh at that idea. You know, it's ridiculous. Why would you let people, uh, you know, spread rumors behind your back and control the narrative when you're the king? You should not allow that. Uh, but strange, you know, you would think, okay, so this guy is you know, probably his gun, his conception of gun rights is going to be something like the Soviets. Like we have all the guns and you have none. And ironically, uh, for very real politic reasons, right? So this is he, his, you know, big ethos was you take morality out of politics. You know, it's mm -hmm. all about power, and you know what's good is what gets you more power. What's better is what you know allows you to retain that power. But for him, he was a very big proponent of private weapons ownership and specifically guns and crossbows. Uh, so he wrote, I believe it's about the the 1500s, so a little bit before the English Civil War. So guns were starting to become very important, but you still had you know, a lot of you know spears, weapons, edge weapons were uh, more the standard, but. Uh, he you know, wrote very glowingly about firearms. He was uh, very positive about this new technology uh, and thought that uh, as a, an effective autocrat, you actually should allow your citizens and encourage them to train with guns. And his reasoning was just purely practical, which was if you take away guns, I, I'm going to have to paraphrase. I don't remember his exact quote, but it was something like, you know, if you despoil, so you take away, if you despoil people of weapons, they're going to resent you and the resentment is going to drive them to acquire those weapons and use them against you. So his basic idea was it's much better to have lots of people underneath you who are loyal to you, who have weapons and know how to use them and will use them to defend your interests and whatever you think is correct. Uh, and that's something I do think people misunderstand about Machiavelli a little bit. I can't pretend to be an expert on him, but he wasn't necessarily advocating being a bad leader. His general position was just, you should do whatever is necessary to acquire power. And then once you have it, you should wield it responsibly. Uh, so it's not um, it, it's not a completely unique concept, right? So there's many people who believe the same thing throughout history. You know, Julius Caesar would probably agree with that as well, where, you know, the, the ends do just, or excuse me, the, um, yeah, the ends do justify the means. So circling back to gun rights though, uh, yeah, he believed that it's, first of all, it's going to be very difficult to effectively disarm people. And we have seen that, you know, even if you look at a place like Australia, where they had this big gun buyback program. I think it's something like a third of all the guns were never given up. So that's still a lot of guns just floating around in Australia. So if the Australians ever did decide to get uppity and um, you know actually assert themselves against their government, which I think is a, an extremely unlikely proposition, but if they did choose to do that, uh, there would be a lot of guns there for them to to use. Um, 
so again, just going back to Machiavelli, he believed that it was actually the smart thing to do as a leader, uh, even if you're trying to be an autocrat, was to encourage the proliferation of weapons and specifically guns so that those people uh, could act in your interests and that trying to take those away, and this is the other corollary of that, the other side of the coin, is if you try to deprive people of their ability to own weapons and defend themselves, you're going to create a ton of resentment and those people are probably going to hate you. Now, nowadays, it's a little bit different. You know, There are other techniques the government can use to mollify people, right? If you have... Uh, you know, if you anesthetize them enough with you know junk food and uh, entertainment and you just give them free stuff, um, you can probably avoid a lot of that. But there's also a lot of people who are not going to be swayed by uh, what Orwell would call cheap palliatives, right? These aren't, you know, we don't care about your your handouts. We just want, um, you know, we want to defend our country and we want to defend our rights. So anyway, yeah, it's, it's a very interesting phenomenon where you have Machiavelli, who most people see as this, uh, you know, they would place him in the same category as like a Hitler or a Stalin, something like that in terms of his views on power. But he had very different views on gun rights. And I think that's very instructive, especially for Americans, where you can make that work. Like you can restrict people's, um, you know, like I said, in modern governments, especially like you look at a country like modern England, modern Germany, where and also there's a lot of propaganda that goes into that. Right. So, um, you know, as you were saying about owning the gun shop, uh, the message is if you care about guns, if you openly talk about liking guns or using guns, you're a bad person. Like you're violent, you're a brute. Uh, that's kind of the message you get when you're in Germany, uh, unless you're into hunting and they have uh, a very kind of bizarre relationship with hunting where it's this uh, almost impossibly expensive sport that you can only do if you're willing to dish out like tens of thousands of dollars basically in Germany. Um, mm -hmm. So it's almost, you know, people will get hunting licenses there as an, just an aside, uh, almost the way some people get golf uh, memberships here, like a membership to a golf club where it's the status um, or, thing. Yeah, exactly. It's almost like a flex on your, your neighbors to have a hunting license, even if you never go. So anyway, uh, that's a little digression, but the point is that there are ways to circumvent people's attachment to weapons, but especially, uh, the time period and the area that Machiavelli operated in, which was Italy in the 1500s, which was extremely violent. I mean, there were constant civil wars. You essentially had Italy had broken up into a number of different city-states that were largely uh, at war with each other. And so people were very touchy about the idea of being disarmed. So anyway, the long story short is um, I think that's something governments should think about now as well is especially in the United States where guns are so available. It's not like Europe where you actually have to go out of your way to get one. Um, yeah, governments should think very carefully about that. And I do think maybe not in cities because uh, cities tend to attract people who, let's just say, gun rights are not one of their top priorities, but people who live outside of cities. Um, yeah, I think that uh, the same principles apply nowadays as they did in 1500s Italy. That's funny because, you know, some of the things you mentioned, you, you mentioned a lot, by the way, <laughs> my, my head is spinning. <laughs> but, but one of the things that um, what, in my generation, so, so when I was little, we were told, don't tell anybody we have guns. And the reason why we didn't tell them because we didn't want them to get stolen. Sure. Then it went to oh, the Obama era where we were embarrassed to say we had guns to now where we're like, no, we have guns. And you might be a little loony if you don't own a gun. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's <laughs> yeah. funny how that's changed. But then you were talking about the rural areas and stuff like in Arizona, a rural area of Arizona, they are all gun-loving Lib, uh, you know, uh, conservatives and in the cities is where it's changed. And I think mm -hmm. it's because in the rural areas, they use their guns as a tool yeah. for hunting, for safety. Like, you know, if you're on the ranch and there's rattlesnakes or whatever. So I, 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 I think you're right. And I do think that it's because people don't see it as a tool anymore. And so why do you have to have it? Why do you need to carry a, cam a hammer with you if you're not going to use a hammer? Mm -hmm. sure. Well, we've farmed out, uh, for lack of a better word, um, our personal safety, thinking that the policemen are going to magically appear before we're harmed, right? And um, that's just simply not the case. It's not a dig on law enforcement. It's just reality. And so uh, the more unrest that we see in our big cities, I think, we're finding the more people that are are realizing and waking up to the fact that, oh yeah, I mean, first responders 
Well, I'm my first responder. I'm the one that it's happening to. So I am responding first. <laughs> and how am yeah. I going to do that most effectively? I'm well, sorry. I ahead. just heard on the radio this morning where uh, the Jewish community, uh, a lot of Jewish people don't, for some reason, don't want to have a gun. And I, I don't understand that because the history and how they were treated, you would think that every single one of them would own a gun. Mm -hmm. But they were talking about in California today, uh, a, a fire instructor said they went from four, I think, fourteen uh, 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 certifications for some Jewish people last October mm -hmm. to two hundred and fifteen. I believe it in October this year. I believe, and it. I think people, you know, sometimes I think people find out too late that mm -hmm. it's time to get a firearm. We see, we hear a lot of people who became victims of of crime, and have changed and decided they don't want to be a victim anymore. But uh, some people just find out too late. Yeah. Sure. Um, yeah. Right. There's that quote, not to, to interject, but there's that quote that, you know, a conservative is the liberal who's been mugged by reality. And I think a lot of people got mugged by reality. And yeah. that's great. Yeah. yeah. I hadn't and, heard um, the word mugged by reality. And that's yeah. awesome. It's a great quote. <laughs> and is. I think um, <laughs> a lot of people got mugged by reality in 2020, where, and that was a really, interesting period in history of American history as well. And it's happened before. There have been many um, racially motivated riots throughout American history, especially in the 60s and 70s. And that's the first time that's come home again. And it was also so widespread. So of course, I'm talking about the Floyd riots. And you know, regardless of what people think about the, um, you know, the actions of Derek Chauvin and George Floyd, the idea that you have you know, thousands of people around the country rioting, burning down cities, um, you know, they killed several dozen people, mostly police officers, caused billions of dollars in damage. And of course, now it's, I think, very apparent that the government could have done way more to stop that. Uh, and mm -hmm. they, it, it, there's a very interesting reason, of course, which, you know, that was an election year. Yeah. And it is interesting how toward the end of that year, suddenly we have a new president and everything just turns off. Like you don't hear about that yeah. stuff at all. There's a little bit of action in Portland that gets shut down immediately by cops and full riot gear with shields and everything. And I think that was, um, I think that was a, a deliberate action on the government to allow a lot of that to continue. And I think a lot of people felt the same way. And I think they realized, okay, so this is how it's going to be now. Uh, and there yeah. will be violence. And there are cases where not only is the government say trying, so this was, I think Cheryl, the example you were kind of using, right? So, you know, maybe a home intruder breaks into your house and the cops are trying to get there as fast as possible, but they just can't. And I think, yeah. you know, there are a lot of great cops out there. And of course they do their best to, to defend us, but of course they're not always there to do it. The more sinister um, scenario is what happened in 2020, where I think there are many cases where people are just deliberately not going into certain areas and they're allowing right. violence to happen um, right. as a tool, a political tool to sow unrest right. and to scare people. Um, because of course, a lot of that violence was directed at, uh, let's say people more on the right of the spectrum. So, yeah. um, you know, I think that is, uh, again, it's another reason why we're seeing a lot more people interested in this topic because they saw this uh, and you, you know, of course there were all the memes floating around that time as well of, you know, liberals and you know, anti-gun people saying, what, you mean you can't just like go into a gun store and buy something? Like, what's this waiting period? I don't understand why are there <laughs> magazine or like suddenly they started to get confronted with all these um, mm -hmm. legalities around gun, uh, gun ownership that they had, didn't even know existed. Uh, mm -hmm. And the reason is because, of course, they suddenly wanted one. And that's not even counting the massive shortage of guns and ammunition um, that occurred during that time as well, just from, uh, you know, demand outstripping supply. So, right. yeah, I, I think that's we're going to see more of that going forward. I think they realize that uh, they can grab a gun quicker than they can call 911, wait for them to answer and then wait for the police to come. Exactly. Exactly. Yep. But training is everything, of course, yeah, right? Yeah, and you course, even talk yeah. about that in your book. You talk about the actual equipment. You talk about carrying, um, you know, uh, emergency medical uh, tools like tourniquets and so forth. Uh, you talk about all of those things and, you know, getting training. And I think that that's tremendous that you added that into your book because all of that is so important. Um, and, and having a, having a firearm without training is almost as bad as just not have a firearm. If you yeah. don't train yourself yeah. well, yeah. then that tool is no good to you. That's so true. We are cutting a little tight on time. I'm already feeling that I want to ask you back so we can dig deeper. <laughs> sure. Um, and, um, so some of the, the really important things I wanted to hit on is 
you know, you have, you're, you are a historian, whether you want to call yourself a historian or not. <laughs> she pointed at you. Um, and there's this idea of the word militia. It has caused so much mm. confusion and angst in our time of having our nation and having our second amendment that they wrote you know the word militia into our second amendment which is all of 27 words long how could we be so up in arms right uh to use a phrase over 27 words but yep. can you sort of quickly unpack the idea of militia and what what our founders meant and i know our supreme court uh has has ruled on this more than once but um to hear it from a, an ordinary citizen who wrote an important book i think it might come across in a new way for people sure no i'm glad you brought that up because i think that's um uh, one of the more confusing aspects of this debate so for people listening the basic idea is because the second amendment says uh, militia so in the text you know it says essentially if you read it at face value it looks like uh, you could argue, and people do, that it is only guaranteeing the right to bear arms for people in the militia. And you ask yourself, you look in the mirror, well, I'm not part of the militia, so I don't have the right to bear arms. And there are leftist activist uh, historians who constantly harp on this point, and they call it, you know, it's the militia only right to bear arms. They It goes by other names, but the basic idea is it is a semantic argument that because the Second Amendment says militia, it only guarantees your right to use the militia. Uh, or sorry, only guarantees your right to use uh, to own guns if you are in the militia. And the modern conception of the militia is the National Guard. Therefore, if you're not in the National Guard, you have no right to bear arms. You have nothing to talk about. You know, shut up and stop bar uh, whining about this. Uh, and there are people like Patrick J. Charles who has a book that um, you know is uh, you know basically this is the entire argument. Uh, and there are many others. Uh, and as you said, this has been debated in the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court, thankfully, has sided with uh, what I think is the rational, reasonable, historical argument, which is that's complete nonsense. Uh, so there are several reasons for that. Number one is just because it says the militia, uh, if you read it, and again, you can, it, it's hard to unpack all of this in a, a podcast like this, but if you read the book, I go into this in great detail, that that's a very, uh, I think, um, misguided, if not uh, deliberately um uh, malicious argument uh, about the Second Amendment. It's being deliberately uh, obtuse, in my opinion. Um, and I think the founders would agree. And if you, especially if you analyze the context around which the, the Second Amendment was drafted, the Bill of Rights in general, it was very clear from looking at the historical documents, letters between the founders, uh, other debates, you know, transcripts of debates, that that is absolutely not what the founders intended. This was intended to be a protection of the right of average Americans who are not, you know, they're not wearing a uniform to bear guns uh, and use them effectively and train with them. Um, and then the other uh, very facetious element of this argument is the militia, as we know it today, is completely different from what it was during the founding period. So uh, during the founding period, the militia included basically anybody who picked up a gun and was ready to use it. Uh, there were some requirements, like you had to have basically a certain amount of ammunition, um, you know, powder cask, you know, stuff like that to, to use your gun effectively. But when it came to the crunch, and we don't have to debate about this, this isn't hypothetical, this is exactly what happened in the war that we fought with England just a few years before this was drafted, where basically if you had you know, the ability to fight and you were interested in doing so, then they would take you in the militia. Uh, you had people, you know, over 60 years old, you know, I talk about one gentleman, uh, I believe his name was Samuel Whittemore, who fought at the battles of Lexington and Concord, who is something like, I think in his 70s, and he ended up getting shot multiple times uh, and then surviving That's a great the war. story. It's incredible. Yeah, and he, he was, you know, I believe in his late 90s when he finally died and, you know, still owned a gun. Um, so essentially the militia encompassed uh, really anybody who was not in your regular army at that time. Um so uh, nowadays, the conception of a militia, I mean, the National Guard, you know, my brother was in the National Guard, and you know, so I can speak a little bit from uh, you know, his experience. It's just regular military who meets less often to train. Uh, mm -hmm. So, And the other thing with the National Guard is, unlike the original militia, which was supposed to be smaller units that would protect like a local community, so you would have, say, the Virginia militia, right, or the Pennsylvania militia, and that's largely how it still was even in the Civil War, and then it, things started to change around that time. 
But the National Guard nowadays is effectively just an instrument of the federal government. Like we have Thank National you. Guard troops being sent overseas to fight in wars, which was absolutely not what the National Guard was originally supposed to be. The, the name Thank is fairly you. self-explanatory. Uh, it's mm -hmm. supposed to be uh, a military unit that operates to defend you know, the country against direct invasion. Uh, obviously, it makes sense to deploy them for natural disasters, things like that. But uh, it was not meant to be mobilized and sent to fight wars with foreign nations overseas. Uh, and that only started around World War I, where right. uh, there was a, a big push to, to mobilize troops for that. So anyway, essentially what they've done is they know that the modern version of militia is completely different and much narrower and uh, more restrictive than it was during the founding period. So now these leftist historians are trying to redefine what the Second mm -hmm. Amendment is by saying, well, it just guarantees your right to own guns in the militia. Which is also just a silly argument on its face, because uh, if you look at what the National Guard is now, you don't need a right to you, know, there, you don't need a piece of paper to say that you can have a gun if you're serving in the, the big military, which is what you're basically doing. So thank you for a variety of reasons. I think that's a very facetious argument. But unfortunately, you have people who have you know high verbal IQ. They can argue persuasively who are pushing this idea. And I think that's actually one of the biggest arguments um, or the, the biggest attacks against the Second Amendment that a lot of people aren't even aware is going on, is it's trying yeah. to be redefined as this right only basically for people who serve in the military. Right. You know, and I mean, it, it doesn't take a very deep dive into history to know that we did not want a standing army that a government controlled we we just fought that off and so um why would we put that in our bill of rights that the government is allowed to have a standing army and you know when the, the rest of the bill of rights is about we the people it's the firewall between the government and the people the the bill of rights is um so many more questions i have this is so hard um but i do want you to give people kind of a call to action um so what in your opinion what is the most important thing or couple of things that every single individual citizen can do right now to protect, to save, to preserve, to positively impact our right to keep and bear arms? Sure. So number one, I would say is just having the courage to share your ideas and your convictions and not you know, being that person who just goes along with the crowd. You know, and that doesn't mean being obnoxious. It doesn't mean, you know, butting into a conversation and saying, well, I love guns when you know you're surrounded by a bunch of people who uh, you know, who don't. Um, <laughs> that can be fun, and, though. You know, you, yeah, you have to use a little bit of tact. Uh, <laughs> unless, of course, you don't, you know, necessarily care about making friends with those people. But, um, you know, I do think this is something uh, actually Tucker Carlson mentioned recently, and I think it's in a, a speech he was giving, I believe, to a school somewhere, um, where simply saying, not being afraid to say your beliefs is very powerful. Um, because naturally, if you have the courage of your convictions and you are not a coward about your ideas, other people are going to resonate with that and they're going to respect it. And I think there are millions of Americans, tens of millions of Americans who, as I said before, don't feel like their government or their elected leaders are actually saying the things they want to hear or looking out for their best interests. So they're looking for other people to do that. And you know, fundamentally, one of the most important aspects of leadership is saying the things that other people are thinking that are true and not being afraid to say them. Um, yes. And I think that's extremely important. And if you do have the truth on your side, which I think we do as gun owners uh, who are advocating for these ideas in an intelligent manner, then you have nothing to be afraid of. And if that means somebody gives you a weird look or says, well, I don't think we should have guns, like you just ignore them. It's like, well, I do. Yeah. So nice. what, you know? Um, so I think that's extremely important is just to say what you believe um, you know, and I think, uh, you know, just having, you know, having some courage, not being a coward mm -hmm. about your beliefs. Um, so mm -hmm. that would be number one. Uh, number two is, you know, arguing persuasively. So having a bit more information on your side, uh, having these, you know, being armed with these facts. Uh, and so you can share them with people. And, you know, I think, uh, there's an important lesson in marketing, which is that you know, people make decisions with emotions first and logic second, you know, this, mm -hmm. uh, that whole Daniel Kahneman book, you know, thinking fast and slow, that's basically the, the fundamental argument and that's been proven many times and i think the same thing is true political beliefs so there's a lot of people who emotionally will not be uh, open to the idea of weapons ownership again going back to the beginning of this interview europeans tend to be uh, often like that not all of them but many of them uh, have this kind of visceral negative reaction to even the idea of guns mm -hmm. and 
uh, again, that, you know, going back to my point about uh, just having courage and just saying, well, yeah, I don't see what the big deal is. I mean, it's a gun. So, you know, it's a, it's a tool and you use it responsibly, just like a car and other things that we use on a day to day basis uh, and not having so not sharing that negative emotion that these other people do. And then if they are open to it, you give them the facts and you just explain it in a very logical manner. And, you know, I also think it's very important just to uh, present yourself well also. Right. So another tool that anti-gun activists will use and you see this all the time i remember there was a, an npr interview um that i listened to uh, well uh I, I think i was in the car with a friend who listened to npr i don't like npr but um they were talking <laughs> basically they had some polished lawyer uh you know they were trying to present like two sides of the argument or make it seem that way the anti-gun guy was some very polished lawyer you know probably went to harvard you know very well spoken and then they trot in the uh the yes. pro-gun guy and of course it's some kind of stereotypical uh, yes. guy who lives in the country, you know, is not yes. as eloquent as the other guy. And they're just trying to make him look like a redneck buffoon. That was the message. Yes. Just like, if you like guns, you're an idiot, you're low mm -hmm. class. If you like guns, you're polished, you're refined, you're modern, you're progressive. Um, and so, you know, I have no problem with people who are like that. I, that's where I grew up. I grew up in Appalachia. Uh, a lot of my friends growing up were exactly like that person. And I have no problem with that. But exactly. we do have to understand that um, that doesn't always uh, present that, that doesn't always present the message that uh, people are going to be receptive to. Yes. So just, you know, I think in many cases, if you have some guy who lives in the city and maybe he's a doctor or something, some other guy who is in a similar social circle as him who is into guns, he's going to be more receptive to that guy's argument than somebody else, which again, yes. goes back to, you can't be confined by your social station and talking about these things. You know, if you're some lawyer who makes, you know, half a million dollars a year and you know drives around in Mercedes wearing a suit, you should be comfortable saying, yeah, I own a gun. Here's why. Just like the guy who, you know, goes out hunting every weekend and lives in a trailer does. Um, you know, I don't, Absolutely. You know, if the truth is on your side, again, I think you should be willing to say that. So um, unfortunately, and of, of course, I would say I would leave this for last, which is, you know, voting for people who actually um, have your best interest in mind, which, you know, for me means they're going to protect your right to bear arms. Um, I would be very suspicious about, you know, conservatives who, are really giving much of any inch to uh, to anti-gun activists. Um, you mm -hmm. know, I think, again, this is something that many conservative Americans are very frustrated about. Is it, you know, it's one thing when you have the people on the opposite side of the aisle arguing against your rights, uh, which you expect, right? Like nobody's surprised mm -hmm. when Diane Feinstein is in, or Chuck <laughs> Schumer are introducing bills, you know, to uh, to restrict firearms ownership. You're like, yeah, that's you know what we expect. But right. then when you have conservatives, supposedly, who are supposed to be advocating for us and being the bulwark against the left, and they're just going along with it, right? It's it's the whole joke is like, well, they just want the, the same thing, but slower as the left does. Mm -hmm. So be very careful with how you use your vote. Don't vote for people who uh, are open to restricting gun rights. Um, and yeah, again, I think the, the trajectory of our country is headed in such a way that it might be that the only solution is really just to try to effectively ignore the federal government. Uh, I don't think that it's going to act in our interest anytime soon, uh, which means focusing more on local politics. So, you know, yes. voting for the sheriff, voting for the mayor, voting for, you know, town council members, whoever it is, um, becoming mm -hmm. one of those members yourself and trying to push these ideas through um, and make sure that they're protected. Um, and another Absolutely. very important thing is that, you know, we say that we're, you know, we're supposed to be a republic. We're essentially a full franchise democracy at this point. Mm -hmm. But just having the majority on your side means nothing, in my opinion. It doesn't mean you're right. If anything, throughout history, the majority is frequently, if not often, wrong. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, we see that all the time. Um, and what does move things is a small, highly motivated group of people who believe in what they're they're doing. Um, that could be for good or bad, you know, bad in the case of the Bolsheviks in the Soviet Union, um, or excuse me, in uh, Imperial Russia, and then what became the Soviet Union, good in the case of the founders, where it was the minority of people who really wanted the revolution to take place, but, um, you know, they got it through, and I think we're better off for it at this point, probably. So, yeah, yeah those would be the things, and, you know, I would say maybe one way to, just to, to wrap this up, because I know we were a little bit tight on time, but Whenever anybody asks me about like what's the point of weapons ownership or the Second Amendment, you know, I, I think deterrence is the best answer, which is mm -hmm. the goal is not necessarily that you're actually going to use a gun. You know, you may have noticed I have a bit of a black eye right now. I, I got that from <laughs> jujitsu. Um, I was guessing jujitsu. You're, you're too polite to say anything. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and you know, uh, I had a friend who, when I started training in jujitsu, uh, I mentioned it offhand. He had asked me what I was up to, and he, he kind of jokingly said, "Oh, so you know how to fight now, huh?" And, uh, you know, we laughed about it and I was like, man, 
one of the most important lessons you learn in jujitsu or any kind of martial art is that you really want to avoid getting in a fight if you, if you don't have to, because things can go really badly, really quickly. And it doesn't matter how well-trained you are. Obviously that helps a lot. And this is true with guns as well, but you know, you can have some, you know, green beret who gets smoked by an errant bullet from, you know, a child soldier in Syria or something like that. So things can go wrong. The point of owning guns is a deterrent. You know, there's a, a lot of truth to the idea that an armed society is a polite society. And the, the goal is that you never have to use it. And I think that goes down to the individual level where, you know, it, there's a reason gun shops generally don't get robbed is because they know that everybody's packing. Um, and there's a reason <laughs> I think that often schools are the target of shootings because, you know, generally schools are supposedly gun-free zones. Um, but there's, that's also true on the geopolitical level. So, you know, Victor Davis Hanson, who's a, a very bright historian who I like quite a bit, has written about this where all wars are really just contests of will where there is a misunderstanding of the power between the nations. So, you know, when Japan attacked us in World War II, they believed that if they took over Hawaii and some of the other possessions overseas, they could use that to strong arm the U.S. into, you know, various concessions. And they didn't, they miscalculated. They thought yeah. that we were weaker than we really were. Uh, and I think the same thing is true with guns. We didn't have an effective deterrence at that time to stop them from doing that because they thought we were soft. And I think the same thing is true nowadays with you know private weapons ownership. If somebody thinks they can break into your home and get off with a light prison sentence, and yes. and this happens all the time nowadays, unfortunately, and a lot of it, um, you know, we again we saw this in 2020 during the Floyd riots, where very few people got punished for a lot of those activities. Um, exactly. If you have a gun, the punishment will be meted out very quickly. Uh, and I, I'm not saying I'm not I'm not advocating for vigilante violence or anything like that, but I am advocating you defend yourself violently if you are attacked violently. Um, so to me, and the the ideal scenario is that person knows that you have a gun or they suspect highly that you might have a gun and you might use it, and they decide, hey, you know what? I'm probably not going to rob his house today, or I'm not going to exactly. go into that school and start shooting kids. Um, exactly. All right. You know, I'm going to get shot. So that's the real goal. Is having the ability to use violence so yeah. that you don't actually have to. Thank you. Perfectly said. All right. We have got to get out of here, but please tell folks, hold your book up one more time. Tell yeah, sure. folks how they can get their own copy and grow their brain with all of your hard work. Hold it up a little bit higher. Ah, sorry about higher. that. So we can see the whole, love it. Okay. Tell folks how they there can find it. Yeah. So it's available on Amazon. Um, you know, the best place to go is just amazon.com <clears throat> put in second amendment manifesto should be right there at the top. Um, you know, Amazon banned me from advertising it. So any sales, uh, you know, any interest in the books greatly appreciate it. Tell your friends about it. Uh, I, you know, I really wrote this just to, to share the message, get the word out, um, and help, you know, people like myself who are curious about this topic. Uh, you know, it's not a, a money-making operation by any means. Um, so yeah, that's the best place to find it. You can also go to secondamendmentmanifesto.com. That'll take you to the Amazon page. Uh, and again, if you just share the book, that's the best thing you can do. Thank you so much for writing it and for taking all of this time with us today. I'm definitely going to be asking you back. Absolutely. No, I would love to. And you know, thank you both for taking the time to interview me and you know, doing all the great work you're doing with the podcast. You know, that's We need more of that. Thanks, thank John. you so much. Bye, John. All righty. Have a good day. Bye. Bye-bye. So I have to tell you that what I got out of this the most. Okay. And it was at the end when he said that he took jujitsu mm -hmm. and that they trained him that you only use, you only fight the last resort. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why firearm training is so important mm -hmm. because, you know, firearm training isn't just about how to load your gun, how to um, point it, mm -hmm. but it's about when to use it. Yeah. And where to use it. Absolutely. And what, if you use it, what happens then? It's training a whole mindset. Right. right. All right. We are so we are. late. <laughs> um, but I, I have to point out what, this crazy shirt you're wearing. Because oh, uh, I forgot my other shirt. Or, oh, because it's Halloween. Because it's Halloween today. Yeah. Um, and uh, we enjoy, uh, you know, our grandkids and all the fun. Yeah, you know, Halloween used to Halloween. be the scariest day of the year for me. Mm -hmm. And now it's every day of the year scary and Halloween's fun. <laughs> it's true. Because all the political crap that's going on. It's true. Well, I want to thank our amazing guest, John Payne. Thank you to all of our awesome listeners all over the globe. 
Um, thank you uh, for, you know, taking these conversations around your tables. That is where the rubber meets the road. You unpack these ideas with, the, with your spheres of influence. If you want to go back and watch this video or any of them, please go to uh, YouTube or GunStreamer or the uh, smartphone app called OpsLens, and you can find all of our um, episodes that we've ever had. Um, if you want to listen to the audio only version, go to our website, gunfreedomradio.com. Click the on demand tab and binge listen to your heart's content, darling. And if you click on the guest tab, there's a huge resource of the subject matter experts, the links to their books like John Payne's page. Um, and there's so much there to learn. And when you spend time there, we don't oh, hate yeah. that. All right. Before we go. Uh, not because it's Halloween, but every day we want to tell you about uh, an amazing company that makes American-made product on American soil that supports American jobs. And you can, well, it includes these delicious snacks, which is why I'm holding that. You're holding that when you should be holding the steak. I know. Their steaks are the best steaks I have ever ate in my entire life. You can order beef. So what you do is you go to patriothousehold.com forward slash GFR for Gun Freedom Radio, patriothousehold.com forward slash GFR. And what you do is you can cut the cord on shopping at those big name stores that do not share our values. And you can help support American jobs. Speaking of share, don't they give a portion to uh, the... The Second Amendment, Second Amendment Foundation, Foundation for all the important work they do. And then we get a little piece too to help us with the work that we do. do. And you can set your order and it gets delivered right to your front door. It can't be any simpler than Even that. The steak. And the steaks, they're so good. Ground beef, steaks, steak strips. We've used all of them and they're amazing. Um, so this is one of our favorite snacks, which is why I keep holding it up. But patriothousehold.com forward slash GFR. Until next time, we are going to pray for our nation. Pray for our leaders. And how about the ones we don't like too much? I haven't been hearing about them too much lately. Is that right? But Maybe my pray prayers for... are working. <laughs> oh, those prayers. Oh, yes. Okay. Yes. All pray right. for the ones you don't like. Especially, Maybe especially the ones. Especially. You don't like. Yeah. Until next time, be good to each other. Have a great week and God bless. Bye bye. 